We're glad you decided to check out this message by Seabreeze Church and hope that you benefit from it. We also hope that you would join us either online or in person on a Sunday. We have a nine o'clock live stream service online, and then we have in-person services on our campus at nine and 1030. So again, we hope that you would join us and we hope that you enjoy this message. Like Bevan mentioned, my name is Andrew. I'm the student pastor here. And before we get going, I just want to let you know that junior high and high school services are coming back on Sunday morning starting next Sunday. I'm really excited for this. It's going to be during this 9 a.m. service. But while I'm here with you today, we're continuing our series that we've called Street Smart. Being street smart over the years has been a name that we give to people who understand the way that the world works. They can navigate life's ups and downs as they use the practical wisdom that they've gained in their life. And in this series, specifically, we're looking at the book of James from the New Testament. He is a very practical man, and his writing and approach to helping people is no different. He doesn't pull punches or mix words. As a leader of the church, James just wanted to help people grow and change. Personally, I'm grateful for the men in my life who have shared hard things with me that they've seen in my life. They've humbly helped me see areas where I needed to grow. During my junior year in college, uh, I was a part of a college ministry, and I I decided it was time that I met up with an older guy uh, to to really get advice about an area that I could grow. And I remember thinking, you know, it was a super spiritual and mature thing to do. I'm going to meet with an older guy and ask him, like, how can I grow, man? I want to use my Christmas break to grow. And I'll never forget, I went to his office, and he had all these books, and it was this big office, and as we started talking after the chit-chat, I just said, okay, so I'm here, I really want to know what's one area in my life where I can grow, and he didn't respond immediately, he just just stood up, walked over to his big shelf of books, and just, he crossed his arms, and like, he looked at it for a second, like he's finding a book, he knew what he wanted to give me, and he grabs a tiny book off the shelf, hands it to me. It's titled Humility. And he just said, literally, Andrew, I think you like to hear yourself talk too much. <laughs> it's like, well, it was hard to hear, but it was right. And it's, it's all I needed to hear. That Christmas break, I devoured that book. And I've been trying to apply it ever since. Um, and a few weeks ago, we read a passage from the book of James that's from James 1.25. It says, But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. It tells us that the words found in the Bible are like a mirror. When we come across these words, we need to take an honest look at ourselves. The, the blessing comes from doing the things that we find there. And so with God's help, we can base our lives off the truth that we find in its pages. As we've been looking through the book of James, there are several big ideas that he calls us to reflect on throughout the pages. We've already looked at how to handle tough times, how to become who we should be, and how to avoid playing favorites. And then today, in today's passage, we will look at how to see beneath the surface and uncover the true mark of a genuine faith in Christ. So let's take a look, starting in James chapter 2, verse 14. He says this, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? He's basically asking, what is the point of holding a belief that has no effect on the person or the world around them, especially when that belief is supposed to radically change that person and the world around them? The problem with that faith is that it isn't the kind of faith that we see in the Bible. It's a theoretical or an intellectual belief that doesn't carry out its purpose. The purpose is to save them. 
In fact, actually, it's a false faith that he's describing. A faith that saves us. That's what we're after in our relationship with God. You can call this a true faith, a real faith, a saving faith, a genuine faith. These terms all describe a moment in someone's life when they decide to follow Christ and commit their whole life to him as their lifelong leader and king. At that moment, they receive complete forgiveness. Their relationship with God is restored, and the Holy Spirit comes to take up residence inside them, and they're going to spend eternity with God. It's a big deal, and we, the church, we, we talk about it all the time, actually. Uh, we call it getting saved, making a decision for Christ, or crossing the line, and it's the most significant moment in a person's life. Rightfully so, it gets a lot of attention throughout the Bible. In fact, one of the main contributors to our understanding of what, what it takes to have a saving faith comes from the Apostle Paul. And in his letter to the church in Ephesus, he says in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. In summary, your works do not save you, your faith and Christ does. This passage by Paul and the one we just read earlier from James were written actually at totally different times to different groups of people in different circumstances. Paul and James are talking about the same moment in time, but from two completely different angles. So what we're doing is we're, we're taking a look at what James is adding to the conversation about that moment in time. And actually, James is broadening or filling out our definition of what saving faith looks like. Let's imagine that moment when someone places faith in Christ like a doorway that they walk through during the timeline of their life. Paul is looking at that moment of faith and is describing what is happening in that moment. And James is looking back at that moment from the future. So Paul is describing the scene taking place on the inside of a person. When someone places faith in Jesus and walks through that door, it cannot be seen from the outside because it's a heart change. And the Jews had a law that they followed on the outside. The general thought that they had was, if I work hard enough, I might be saved. They had to do a lot of things, they thought, to earn God's favor. When Paul described this life-changing moment, he let people know that it wasn't earned or purchased by their actions. It's something that was offered free of charge because of God's grace to them. Our role in that process is to believe him to the point that it affects what we do. Saving faith isn't a product of good works that you do. Paul makes that very clear for us. And so James is looking back at that moment from the other side of the doorway and asking, was that faith genuine? Did they actually decide to follow Jesus Christ in that moment? After someone decided to follow Jesus, what changed about their life that proved that that faith was real? That's the question. He looked back at that decision in order to address actually a completely different issue that he saw at that time. He was addressing the issue of license. And when we get a license, we've passed a test, and we now have the freedom to do whatever that license allowed us to do. I had several different licenses during my time as a stockbroker that made it legal for me to trade stocks for other people, to train new people to be stockbrokers. Whenever I decided to ride a motorcycle, I had to get a motorcycle's license There are licenses to teach, to drive cars, to set up businesses. And with each of those licenses, there are also checks and balances in place to make sure that the licenses don't get misused. With some within the church thought that their freedom from their sin gave them the license to sin. They got their passport stamp for heaven. You know, they were in and they weren't responsible for their actions anymore. The idea was, you know, I can believe in Christ without changing anything in my life. And James wanted to make sure that the churches understood that that wasn't a genuine saving faith. That was a false faith. True faith is one that believes to the extent that your life is changed. It's not service level. So I mean, a couple of years ago, I showed a project motorcycle um, that was given to me. And you see the picture behind you. It was too far gone. So now it is gone. But... Don't worry, a few months ago, I got a different one. It's also not pretty, but it's prettier than the last one. And when you get up this close, you do see issues on the surface, surface surface-level corrosion, 
some surface level dirt and grease, some scratches. I want to encourage you, don't judge a book by its cover. It's got good bones. And none of those things keep it from actually doing what it was made to do. It was made to take people to places, and it does that. It's a bonus if it looks good in the process, but it would be wrong to think, oh man, great paint job, that thing must be fast, or it's got some scratches, must not run. What's on the surface is not a true indicator of whether it's running. Likewise, our faith in Christ is supposed to operate on a deeper level. James wants to help us test whether our faith goes deeper than just the surface. In this passage, James points out two surface-level signs of faith that by themselves don't guarantee that a true faith is present. They're good things, but they don't give the full picture. The first is a surface level of emotion. In James chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, he says, Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm and well fed, it does nothing about their physical needs. What good is it? We often associate strong emotion with strong faith. But James presents us here with something that's different. In this scenario, there, there is a fellow Christ follower who is known to be without food or clothes. They don't have a regular food source. And if their situation doesn't change, they could die from starvation or exposure. That's the trajectory that they're on. Another Christian happens upon the scene who can do something about it, and they're moved by the situation. So they walk up to them and say, be blessed, warm, and fed. What did the poor Christian think was going to happen when their fellow Christian came to talk to them? They probably thought, you know, I'm saved. Nope. What happened? Nothing helpful. Their fellow Christian had an emotion. They saw a need and were moved enough to say something, but that didn't turn into a helpful action. They basically had an emotional response that triggered empty words because they weren't backed up by action. It might have made them feel better, but, but that's about it. James summarizes it, the next verse this way. Chapter 2, verse 17, he says, In the same way, faith by itself, it is not, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. That poor Christian might as well have tried to get help from a dead body. It was pointless. The fact that there was no action to help that brother or sister reveal that that person's faith was not real. It was dead. So here's the point. The strength of our emotion doesn't dictate the strength of our faith. You know you're operating at a surface level of emotion when, you have, when having a certain emotion or needing to feel up becomes the goal of your faith. When it's put in its proper place, our emotions can be an enhancement to our faith, just like a good paint job would enhance my motorcycle. But our level of emotion shouldn't be trusted as an indicator of our maturity or our faith. When we have a faith in Jesus, it really will affect our emotions. Being moved emotionally is a good byproduct of a genuine faith. I mean, when I hear of someone's life being changed by Jesus, or I'm hit with the reality of how much I've been forgiven, I can be really moved. But I can also be moved by most Pixar movies. <laughs> so an emotional response is not an accurate indicator of whether my faith is genuine or mature. It's a really good byproduct of the real thing. It's just not the critical thing. The new motorcycle project I picked up, like we saw just a second ago, has some cosmetic issues. But worse than that, when I got it, it had sat for five or more years. The carburetors were clogged up. The gas tank was a rust bucket. It was so bad. And it smelled so much like gasoline that I needed to store it on my front porch so I didn't stink up my neighbor's apartment. Like, it did not run. It was dead. It had some rust and stuff on the outside, but I wanted a working motorcycle that I could ride and enjoy. So I put my restoration project into two phases. Phase one was the most important, get it running, make sure I didn't waste money on it. And phase two was to make it look, look nice. Having a faith that causes us to change what we do is like phase one of my project. It's the critical part. Without a faith that works, it's like putting a new paint job on a dead vehicle that can't run. And like everything we come across in the Bible, we need to look in the mirror first. And so I've come up with a few questions for us to ask ourselves based on this passage. The first question is, do I overemphasize emotion? Basically, what role does that have in my faith and in my life? Do I get 
moved emotionally but miss the practical step? That's the second question. Do I get moved emotionally but miss the practical step? I encourage you to ask yourself questions like that so you can pinpoint the next step of your faith. And this brings us to the second surface level sign of faith. And that's a surface level of belief. In James 2, 18 through 19, he says, But someone will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. The word here for believe is persuaded. If you have come to believe in something, you must first be persuaded that it's true. That means that you've looked into the matter, you've asked questions, you've looked for the evidence, you've weighed it, and you've made a decision. You've been persuaded. True faith does not come from a blind leap without reason. There isn't a religious lobe in your brain that turns off higher brain functions like logic and reasoning. Our faith is based on the truth, and we shouldn't be afraid to ask our real questions. But an intellectual belief is only part of the equation. We must beware of surface-level belief. That is the mind that says, I believe, without acting on it. That level of belief is incomplete. It could be factually accurate, but still incomplete. In fact, the demons have that level of belief. There is a very real enemy of God, and demons are his helpers. They're seeking to oppose the things that God does and those who have decided to follow him. From their perspective, they know that there is one God. When James says, you believe that there is one God, he was actually bringing up a really important theological belief for all the Jews at that time. This was one of their statements of faith. It was called the Shema, and every good Jew believed it. So do the demons, and it makes them shudder. Do they have faith? Well, no, not the kind of faith that James is talking about. James is saying that if you are only intellectually convinced that Jesus is the Son of God, you have the same faith as demons. To have a saving faith, you must believe that and actually follow Jesus. What was missing from the demon's faith was submission to God. James 2, 20 through 24 says, You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. Why would you believe something is true but never act on it? The reason we can believe something to be true but never do anything about it is that submission to God always has a cost associated with it, a personal cost. If you want proof, we can look at Abraham. In the book of Genesis, God creates a nation named Israel that started with a promise of offspring to one man. His name was Abraham. He was old and well past the age any one of us would want to become parents, and so was his wife, but he believed God to do what he had promised, and God accepted that faith. Later on, that faith was proven to be genuine by Abraham when Abraham was given a pretty big test in his life. He was told to climb a mountain and sacrifice the son who fulfilled God's promise. At the last second, God provided a different sacrifice and spared the son's life. But Abraham's faith was tested and proved to be genuine in that moment. God knew that Abraham's faith was genuine, but it was proved to us in the rest of history by his willingness to submit his plan to God. The word submission means to put under. When we submit to God, we, we're putting our desires, our goals, and our aspirations under his authority. We no longer have the final say about the purpose and direction of our lives. That's been given over to God for him to oversee. Saving faith is one that lives based on what God says. When our desires come into conflict with God's desires, the question is, whose will win out? Well, Abraham's cost was his son. And in the New Testament book of Hebrews, we actually get to see what this did for Abraham's faith. Hebrews eleven seventeen 17 through 19 
It says, By faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his only, one and only son, even though God had said to him, It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead, and so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. So here we see the intellectual belief sprouting limbs and walking. It even says that Abraham reasoned that God was able to fulfill his promise of offspring through Isaac, even though he was commanded to sacrifice his son Isaac. So out of obedience, Abraham took his son on a long journey to the altar Think about the story. I just can you imagine every step of that journey with his son? Every step would have been a conscious decision to move forward in faith as he counted the cost the whole way. I imagine every step was one of submission and trust in a God that he knew personally. And submission really is is what takes our faith out of the theoretical and into the bra- the practical. It gives our thoughts and ideas and beliefs, hands, and feet to affect the world that's just outside of our minds. There will always be a personal cost when we choose to obey God. Sometimes that cost is is small, and other times it can be pretty large. But the way of submission to God, regardless of our feelings, is always the right way. A true faith is one that submits to God and chooses to follow Him. I've heard it said many times that you spell the word faith, R-I-S-K. Walking with God is always... A risk. It will require one. And in those moments where what we want conflicts with what God wants, our faith is tested. We can trust Him and submit to Him. So here's my question for you. In what way is God asking you to take a risk in your relationship with Him? What costs are you being asked to pay right now that you need to pay? Do you need to pay the price of less sleep to wake up and spend time with Him? It's one I regularly have to pay. Are there areas of your life that you know don't honor him and you need to take the risk of being open and honest with someone about it so that you can begin the process of getting help? Are you stuck in a pattern of sin that might lead you to damage your future? Do you need to submit that to God and take the risk of moving forward to to begin the process of getting out of that pattern? God can and will help you as you seek him for help and change. He meets us as we move forward. So now is the time for us to be serious about our relationship with God and the next steps of obedience that he gives us. Ask God to help you know what your next step is and get moving. I want to encourage you to do that. The ultimate proof of a saving faith isn't an emotion or an intellectual belief. The ultimate proof of a saving faith is whether our belief causes us to act. And James is right. We need to see below the surface of emotion and intellectual beliefs to uncover the true faith that acts in our world. Faith is trusting God enough to do what he says. It's not a perfect faith, but it is proved to be real when it causes you to act, change, and grow. Let's pray. God, thank you for your words that we find here in James. Thank you for the fact that you offer us forgiveness, free of charge, because of what Jesus has done on the cross. What you ask is that we submit our whole lives to you and walk with you. And in response, we, we get to experience transformation and we get to live with you for eternity. God, that's such a great hope and future that we have if we've decided to follow you. I pray that today each one of us would walk away reflecting on what you would have us do. God, we each want to have a faith that is real, that's genuine. And I pray that you would help us to do that this week and to take that next step that you give us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.